So that's pretty much where I'm buying all my stuff from Amazon. Mm -hmm. And Amazon Prime buyers, we're a unique bunch. We we we're not we're price conscious, but that isn't the biggest decision we make when we when we are deciding what to buy. A lot of times it comes down to convenience. You know, if you can get something that's Prime eligible in two days, you're going to get it. And right. if totally. if as an Amazon seller, if my product is in the warehouse there, it's you know it, someone can buy it quickly, and and it's awesome. Are you a busy mom in business who's working mostly from home? Tired of seeing lots of other mamas online crushing it and wondering how they juggle kids, school, camps, lunches, dinner, potty training, laundry, cleaning, homework, soccer practice, ballet, doctor visits, toddler tantrums, teen tantrums, neglected husbands, dog walking, volunteer school duty, and all of that other stuff? Are you scratching your head trying to figure out how they manage to get all of it done so they can be successful in their businesses? Well, then you're in the right place. Welcome to the Audacious Mamas Show. You're about to hear behind the scenes insights from some of the most successful moms on and offline, as well as professionals who can help all of us make our business and home lives more streamlined and prosperous. You'll get tips, insights, and lots of validation. Yes, ladies, the struggle is real, even for the most successful mamas. Here's your host and one of the most audacious mamas around, Steph Roberts. Welcome to the Audacious Mama Show. I'm your host, Steph Roberts, and I am really psyched because today I finally have my friend Lori on the show. Lori is a business strategist. She's a social media strategist. And she also is a voiceover artist, so you may recognize her voice. But I've been trying to get her to share with us some tips on Amazon FBA and some of the online selling sites, including eBay. She's pretty much moved over the majority of her things that she's selling online to Amazon. And she's done some incredible things with her side stream of income. And I asked her in this interview, like, what's the deal? What are you earning? Because um, she'll share her story with you, but she needed to earn multiple thousands of dollars to cover her dad's care. So she was able to do that, you guys. On the side, she has two other businesses that take up a lot of her time. So I thought, you know what? The mamas need to hear this because there are a lot of moms out there looking for a side gig that kind of fits their lifestyle. And, you know, I know as well as you do, yeah, we can do some shopping online ourselves. I use Amazon. I'm an Amazon Prime member. She talks about that. But also you find yourself at Target. You might be at Kmart. You might be at um, Walmart. You might be at the grocery store. You might be at some other store and you see that bargain bin or you find something and you're like, wow, really? This is only this much? Usually this is four times, six times the price, and maybe the the idea goes off in your head, the light bulb, that you could sell it. And anyway, that's what if that's ever occurred to you or if you've ever thought about it, this episode is for you. And even if you've never thought about it, but you just need something fle flexible, especially this summer when you're maybe you have your kids home and it's just trickier. If you have a service business, your personal quiet time uh, becomes much more challenging for most of us in the summer, depending on the age of your kids and whether they're home or away or what. So also has offered this incredible tip sheet that she put together. It's a cheat sheet. So listen to this for sure. But the tip sheet is going to be at audaciousmamas.com slash Lori. It's L-O-R-I. So audaciousmamas.com slash Lori. If you don't have time to listen to the whole episode right now, go check it out. There's great stuff there and um, more about her background, but she has a financial background too. So she gets in deep to the numbers. How do you justify what it is you want to sell online? Easy ways to kind of build up some income to have money to play with and experiment with. And then what are the numbers, which some of us entrepreneurs are not totally numbers people. So she's a financial person and she knows how to do it. Uh, I guess I would say the safe way. <laughs> so you don't lose money. So I'm so psyched. My friend of geez, almost over 21 years, I think 
excited to have her on the show. And without further ado, here she is, Lori Geishecker. Enjoy, guys. Welcome to the Audacious Mamas podcast. I'm your host, Steph Roberts. And today I have a familiar voice. I have the voice of my intro with me, the lady behind the voice, that is, Lori Geishecker. And Lori is a business and social media strategist. She's also a voiceover artist professional. And she is an e-commerce um, ninja something. I don't know. She's amazing. <laughs> and that's really why I'm having her on because I've had, we can talk about everything that she does. But today, the main focus is going to be on Amazon FBA and maybe a little bit about eBay and kind of how she uh, folded that into her life. So welcome, Laurie. I will let you start uh, telling your story. <laughs> thank you, Steph. I'm so glad to be here. It's yeah. nice. I'm an honorary audacious mama now. You are. Exactly. Well, you definitely don't have to be an audacious mama to be on the Audacious Mama show. <laughs> you just have to be as audacious as you are. And she is somebody that I've known, just so you guys know. What is it? It's more than 20 years, right, Lori? Yeah, I it's think so. Because time. when did we take that class? It was mid-90s, right? We went to, now you're going to tell everybody how old we are. We went to, we <laughs> no, went to no. the I'm Connecticut School of Broadcasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which is no longer there, by the way, it's in that probably location. Not, no. I, I drove think, by recently. That's too funny. I think it still exists, though, right? And now they move into so. multimedia and online stuff, probably. But I know. Funny. We got out right before all the good stuff hit. Right. And then we worked together a little bit after that. And then we had a big, giant gap of like more than. 15 years where we didn't and then twitter yay <laughs> <laughs> i love social media for that reason it feels so good. <laughs> oh it my gosh so it's nice. true though it was so funny i thought wait a minute this can't possibly be happening I and then I, you know here it was we you know neither one of us left the state so it wasn't like right. it wasn't like we had you know we had lost track from right a cross country move or something like right. that and then we got, you know, got back in touch and realized both of us were doing a lot of stuff online so and, and trying to propel our businesses forward and thought, oh, my God, we're we're pretty much at the same spot now. I it know. was really cool. That was really cool. Yeah. And yeah. it was so nice to have a biz bud like in real life that I could talk yes. to because people don't get all this online stuff anyway. So, yeah. So that's how Lori came to be um, the voice of of the Audacious Mama show. And she's just... She's a wonderful human being, so I'm so excited. I've tried many times to say, come on, i got to interview you about this, that, the other thing, whatever. And uh, Yeah, so you, you succeeded. This yeah. one was a keeper. I, I thought, all right, okay, she's right. <laughs> this would be awesome. It would be so much fun. Yeah. And, you know, I know how happy it's made me, just, like, all the different ways I've been able to to make money as as a business owner. Like, my last job that I was basically an employee was – way back in the 2000s and wow. I've been working for myself ever since but it's um you know it's hard when you're a business owner you know mm -hmm. like there are business interests that are really passive and business interests that are really active and right. two out of my three the the business strategy and social media which I kind of group together as one yeah and the voiceovers both of those entities require me to participate actively right. like I I am the product essentially yeah. so excuse me, when I started, you know, thinking about a more passive income stream, I kind of fell into it by accident. I didn't expect to be selling online. And, uh, you know, back in 1999, eBay was the only game in town. Mm -hmm. And that's where I started. I had, you know, it's funny, I've told you numerous times offline stuff that I hate to shop. It is my, <laughs> like, Same here. I hate, hate to shop. And yeah. so for me, this was kind of funny. It was the irony. It was just bittersweet that here I was in a store <laughs> that I really didn't want to be in, you know, with all these people and fluorescent lights. And somehow I found myself, it was like a TJ Maxx or something. Yeah. And I'm looking at this corner display and I'm thinking, wow, that is a really cheap price for this body lotion that I know sells for like three times this price. Wow. And I figured, well, maybe I could sell it on eBay. And I did. I started selling there. I picked up all these things that I thought were random, brought them all home, wow. you know, took photos of them with the actual camera, not the iPhone. Right, right. Oh, <laughs> and wow. edited the pictures on my computer and yeah. started listing. Wow. And I've been doing it ever since. And it's um, it's definitely taken a, a path that I didn't anticipate. I didn't yeah. think when I first started on, on eBay that it would be anything more than side, you know, side income. And essentially, it, it was just a, you know, hobby money or like extra mm -hmm. money for a long time. 
And then I realized, wait a minute, you know, people are really getting active on these platforms. And at that time, as I said, eBay was the only game in town. So I I realized as much as I loved it and I thought there was a, a, a good income stream from it, the thing I really didn't like was that I had to do everything myself. And, you know, you remember if, if you've ever bought anything on eBay, especially at the beginning, you have to do that whole dance about feedback. Oh, right. <laughs> and, you know, you really have to start, you, you basically are, you're in charge from, mm-hmm. excuse me, the, the time, the time and that you put in to source the item, you bring it home, you photograph it, you list it, and then you have to keep it until it sells. And then once it sells, you have to go through this, all this back and forth with your buyer and shipping and you box it up and you mail it. And did they get it? And all this, this stuff. Right. You're doing every single thing. And I thought, this is an awful lot of work. And it also limits, at the time, I didn't have a lot of space to store anything. And it limits the amount of space that I have to store inventory because I have no no area to do it. So I'm not going to be buying like a stereo to sell it. I have to right. be buying these small <laughs> things to sell. And I thought, all right, this long term, this may not work. And at the same time that I was having this realization, Amazon kind of started blooming. Mm-hmm. And they remember, you know, you remember they were books at the beginning, right? right. Amazon was known just for books. So. Right. I got to unload a whole lot of college books, a whole lot of used textbooks, and I started kind of exploring that that platform. But it was still the same process at that point that eBay was, that you basically held on to the inventory at, you know, at your house, your apartment, wherever you were based out of. And then you sold it when it's when it's sold, you mailed it out and you took responsibility for getting it Uh, to the the buyer. So, again, it's like, ugh. But that doesn't then, sound fun to me. <laughs> no, no, it really doesn't. And then I heard, I was listening to this, like like an eBay radio kind of show. And it was a show. It was actually based on, it was before podcasts. And it was based on, uh, you know, like you, you listen to it on the web. Hmm. And I heard someone talking about Amazon FBA. And I had never heard of that before. And Amazon FBA is fulfilled by Amazon. And so basically, you can take advantage of Amazon's warehouses. So you send the product in once you find it. You, you source it, you box it up, you mail it in, and Amazon wow. takes care of the rest. So it's like, wow. it's a dream. Wow. So are they literally, so let's say it was that mascara that, you know, everybody wants, but, you know, mm-hmm. it's discontinued and you found it somewhere and, you know, you, you're going to get a good turnaround on it. Yeah. Do you send it in the pack? Like, you don't have to have the little boxes or whatever. Like, they literally will put whatever the product is as you'd find it on the shelf? Or do you have to That's- do anything else? No, essentially, you you can just buy it off the shelf and send it in. There okay. are there are some certain requirements for certain items. Like if you have a, a glass item, it has to be packed a certain way. Okay. For so it basically has to pass a warehouse test where they take it out of the box and basically slam it on the floor. Oh wow! <laughs> not, as, not as like high, you know. Yeah, not as. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty funny when you see these videos that Amazon does. That's it's not hilarious. as dramatic as that, I guess, but. It it is funny. They you know they have very strict requirements because they want their buyers to be happy. Yeah. And you know they they want to make sure that the item gets to them and and that they keep buying from Amazon. So that's really the only restriction that I've come across where you have to make sure you're packaging it appropriately. But yeah, you just basically buy it off the off the shelf. You um, put a label on it that identifies it as yours. It's called an MSKU. Mm-hmm. And then you can print it out on your, you know, with just like the the return address kind of labels that you would get from Avery or, you know, at Staples or something. Okay. You print it out in your, your printer and you put it on the item and then you box it up and send it in. So once it gets to Amazon, they know it's yours and they can find it in all of their wear houses I don't know how they do it but somehow they do they know when someone orders you know that mascara that it's coming from your little area in the warehouse and they pluck it up and they put it in the box and send it out and the the main benefit of being an Amazon FBA seller is that your your items are prime eligible do you know you know what prime is right yes exactly Yeah, yeah I've been a prime member for years I love it it's awesome. I mean, I can't, the UPS guy knows me on a, you know, first name basis because I'm not only am I sending things to Amazon, I'm getting so much stuff because that's pretty much where I, as I said, I hate to shop. So that's pretty much where I'm buying all my stuff from Amazon mm-hmm. and Amazon prime buyers. We're a unique bunch. We, we, we're not, we're price conscious, but that isn't the biggest decision we make when we, when we are deciding what to buy. A lot of times it comes down to convenience. You know, if you can get something that's prime eligible in two days, you're going to get it. And right, if, totally. if as an Amazon seller, if my product is in the warehouse there 
it's, you know, it, someone can buy it quickly and, and it's awesome. Hey guys, I just wanted to interrupt for a sec and say, I know I've been talking about video for a while, but I'm super excited because we had Instagram stories, which was really fun. We could tell these short little quick 15 second clips that connect us with our our audience, our potential clients, other people, and it's a great way to kind of go behind the scenes. And now there's Facebook Messenger Day, which allows you to connect again with people who you're connected to through Messenger, but in a more direct way with people who might be your ideal clients or customers, as long as they're connected to you on Facebook. It's pretty cool, and I'm not recommending that you spam anyone, but what I've noticed is that the people who are doing Facebook Messenger Day videos well, there's just not a lot of them out there. So you're really ahead of it. If you are interested in this at all, I just put together a package of five videos. They're custom made for you with a special price for my listeners. And I'm excited to start delivering these packages. So they're just 15 seconds each, which is what Messenger Day will allow. And also Instagram You can kind of use them anywhere because it's so tiny. You could also use them for um, Facebook ads if you wanted. And so it's animation, music, some text, images, um, graphics, as well as very, very short video if you have something under 15 seconds that could be pulled in. So I'm excited about these. If you're at all interested, all you need to do is send a text to 44222, 44222, and write the word vital video. That's V I T A L video vital video, all one word, and you will get my six step formula for successful promo videos to give you a leg up and give you some ideas on how to get started on this. It'll also let me know that you're interested. You'll get a little bit more information from me on how to connect with me more directly. And hopefully we can connect after that. And I would love to give you the special price for my listeners and start working with you and just get these out there. So I just launched one of my one of my longer video clients and she is doing really well with her new video and I just am so excited to see the responses in her Facebook group. So this stuff works, it's really exciting. It does great things for you, your image, keeps you out there and the more creative you can be, the better. And again, with this little package, you can do a rotation of five different videos so you don't have to limit your focus to just one thing. And um, yeah, so I'm excited about that. Enjoy the rest of the show. Thanks. So it's really, it opened my eyes up to the whole, you know, again, this was a a stream that could be more passive because I only had to do the first two things, Mm -hmm. buy it and send it in. And then the rest of it, you know, Amazon took care of the rest. They fulfilled the order. They, you know, made sure it was in good condition. If the customer returns it, they take care of it on that end as well. So headache wise, customer, it's not like I don't like people, I do. Right. <laughs> but you know, customer, yeah. customer service is a, is a really hard part of retail oh, and, yeah. any, and in, in any business, I think, really. Yeah. You know, customer service is, is an area that you really have to spend time on. And, you know, this was a nice way to, to achieve some passive income without doing a lot of extra customer service work. Yeah, so I that, really like it from that end, too. That's awesome. And I was just thinking, you know, I think we talked about this more than a year ago and I was like, okay, where do I get one of those scanner guns? It's not really a gun. It's just your phone, <laughs> your phone with the app. But I was thinking the same thing. Cause I'm like, you know, a lot of the stuff with social, social media consulting with the two being a single mom with two little kids, it's like, I cannot, there's only so much of me to go around and, you know, I want to have my own business so I can be present for my kids, not constantly pushing them aside. Like, sorry, I got to take this text or this call or this video or whatever. So I think for moms, and I know you have a a checklist of four different things. I think the the main thing is just being able to, I don't love shopping, but I'm going to have to be in stores sometimes. And uh, unfortunately, I have to drag my kids with me most of the time. Right. So I might as well be there with them watching what attracts them, you know, to really take advantage of that whole, like, is it popular? Is it not? And we talked about those little those little fidget spinners that I spotted back in December and I should have jumped on it then. But Stephanie, if I had known, like, I I think audacious mamas, I think mamas, parents in general, you have a built in advantage when it comes to sourcing items to sell online, whether it's Amazon or eBay, you really, you, you have such an asset in your kids. I mean, you already know this anyway, but your kids are your secret weapon. You bring them into the store and they'll immediately gravitate to what is popular at the time 
what they love, things mm-hmm. they'll open your eyes to to things that you wouldn't even imagine would be popular. And the, the fidget spinners are a perfect example. I didn't even know what they were until recently because <laughs> I don't have kids. Right, and I'm right. thinking, what the, what is this? Oh, <laughs> I know I could kick, course. I could kick myself because I wanted one for my older daughter because, you know, it's supposed to be good for, you know, ADD, ADHD, whatever. Or at least that's how it was marketed in the store I was in way back in December. And then by April, people were just like, in these private groups saying, do you know where I can get a fidget spinner? (laughs) Like everybody had them and they were running out and it was just crazy. And uh, you know, the funny thing is Sienna never wanted one. She still doesn't. Good. I'm right there with you, Sienna. I know, right? (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. But I, I would say that's, you know, bringing your kids and starting on your very next shopping trip, you have Mm -hmm. a smartphone, you have the kids, you've already got two things right there. Load the smartphone with these free selling apps that you can get. And once you sign up, as an Amazon FBA seller, yeah. you, you're you part of Amazon Seller Central. That's basically your hub, and that's where you run all of your sales um, items through your inventory, your orders, everything. So once you are logged in, you you know, you know buy the – that's really – actually, I should say right up front. That, that is your only cost that you really have to pay aside from inventory when you first start. It's a $39 a month fee. Right. And then basically, you know, you pay for – it's basically this, a subscription, I guess you would say. Sounds like to it. Amazon, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you do, you know, you pay it every month. It's forty dollars you have to make for your sales. So if you're not going to be selling at least forty dollars worth of stuff, it's probably not a good place to start. But right. for the most part, when you're out shopping, you're going to find stuff pretty quickly that will fulfill that. And once you have the apps, the apps are amazing. There's one that Amazon actually produces themselves. So that's the Amazon Seller Central app. Okay. And then a service like uh, Scan Power. That's another one that I really like. And Scan Power, you have different tiers. So you can do a free tier, which I pretty much stay on the free tier because I don't, I don't usually have enough of a, of a single item that I'm sending in that would move me to the next level. So I stay, you know, pretty much on the Scan Power free tier, and I think a lot of people would when they start as well. But they hook right into the Amazon catalog in real time. Wow. So you can make your buying decisions right there based on real time information. You can check, okay, is it first, is it in the category? Is it, uh, the, I'm sorry, the Amazon catalog? Does Amazon actually sell it or has someone sold it on Amazon before? And you can figure out right then and there. It also tells you if Amazon sells the product themselves. And you mm-hmm. don't really want to be in a position where you compete with Amazon because they okay. hold the cards. They can, you know, drop Smart. the price, raise the price. They can get whatever they want for inventory. So mm. that would, you know, I would stay away from an item that Amazon already sells. But you can also figure out how many other Amazon FBA sellers are there. And if it's, you know, maybe one or two or three, yeah, get in on that. That's a, probably going to be a great, you know, if other things are all equal, that would be a great item to sell because your competition is low. And that's always okay. good, right? You know, it's you yeah. and a couple other people. So and- that's... And is that, that one of the out. key things that you look for is low number of competitors? Like, what is your I, threshold? Do you yeah, have one or not? I, per- I personally do. I think um, I have the second tip actually would be to know your numbers. And that's mm-hmm. part of it. One thing I just want to say um, about, about the app stuff that I think a lot of people don't realize is some of these apps will tell you whether or not a product is restricted. And like a lot of big brands, oh. like beauty brands, for example, mm-hmm. um, Smashbox or Bliss or okay. like, you know, prominent makeup brands, they... They restrict their sales on Amazon. You have okay. to be an authorized seller. Got it. So the app will tell you. And if you don't, if you get an app, you know, that tells you, yeah, this, this Smashbox highlighting wand is restricted. Well, if it's still a good price and you know people want it, go over to eBay and sell it there. Um, you know, take advantage of that too. It's not as passive, obviously. Right. But, but why leave money on the table, right? Exactly. Yeah. No, especially if it's something really hard to find and you can get that markup. Yeah, that yep. profit. Yeah, it's totally so, worth it. Is that the other thing? So that's like when you say no, the numbers. You know, the first thing that occurs to me is the numbers are okay. So you've got your monthly subscription right off the bat. Yeah, you've got your competitors, and then the other thing you're looking for is the price you're buying it at the store now versus what's the highest price somebody has paid for it, or do you try to figure out what they would pay? Like. What's that? Well, I usually look at the real-time data when I'm okay. scanning the item. So, th- and really, the buying decision that that buying decision is the most critical part of the whole process. Because if you overpay for an item and then have to sell it at cost, or there's too much competition, you know, you're going to lose money, and that's not mm-hmm. the goal. You want to make money, right? Right. So, I think for for me personally, I do the rule of threes. Basically, I 
if I can sell something I buy for three times what I paid for it, I'll mm -hmm. buy it. And that's the primary, that's my primary rule. So I, I look at it this way, like a third will cover the purchase price and then a third covers the Amazon selling fees associated with that. Mm -hmm. And then a third will be profit or okay. something I can reinvest. So I kind of, I, I look at it that way. There's also another thing called sales rank and I do, it, it can fluctuate, it's not always accurate, but I like to look to see where an item is in a sales rank and the lower the sales rank in, so if it's like 1% or mm -hmm. if it's like 1,000 in a certain category, you you would wanna buy that because that means that item is selling. It's selling at a pretty okay. good rate at a higher velocity. It doesn't always mean that it's going to sell for a good price, but you know that is it is selling. So that's one you know part of the criteria that I look at. So I okay. like to stay personally with items that are selling in the top 10% of that sales rank in that product category. So if I'm selling mascara, uh, it's a certain organic, um, you know, two pack of mascara color that you really can't get any place else and everybody knows it. So everyone's flocking to Amazon. Mm -hmm. That's probably going to be an item that's in the top 10%. And I want to okay. just check, you know, just check it as I'm going through. But I find if I stick to those two rules, the rule of three and trying to stay with items that are in the top 10%, of the category, it keeps me out of trouble. Okay. <laughs> it definitely keeps That's me out of trouble. That's great. So you have, what's been your greatest loss story? Do you have a story where you've lost? Oh God, I have, I have made so many mistakes. <laughs> so <laughs> many, <laughs> so oh, wow. many mistakes. Things that I just made one recently that was a doozy. I had, um, I had purchased um, some pet food like you know what is the what is the supplement you use if you have achy knee joints like uh, glucosamine oh, is that what it yeah, is yeah yeah something, something like, like that. that right yeah mito something, it was something yeah. like that yeah it was something like that but for dogs and mm -hmm. it, and it was organic and it looked it looked pretty good and it was a reasonable price and i scanned it and i thought oh yeah okay this is good you know it's selling on amazon it's got a good price got a good you know everything looks good here i'll i'll take a few so i bought i'd say about 10 i think okay. 10 and i started <laughs> I started uh, prepping them for shipment to, to send them into Amazon to the warehouse. And when I looked at my Amazon Seller Central, it was telling me that the cost related to selling it, like the actual fees, was $15. And I thought, $15? I just paid $3 for this wow. item. Why is it? Yeah. And it turned out that I had misread the listing. And oh. it was actually for 75 like a 75 pack of these little oh. like it was it, I had totally messed up so oh. I bought these things thinking it was it was the the higher priced item and it wasn't oh, no. and I had to return them all and I, the good thing was I caught it before I sent it in so that was nice. and you were able to return it That's I was able to return good. this but another big big issue that I um, encountered with seasonal items especially was that I overbought. So the first, mm -hmm. like I had, I would find something like say in the spring season, that would be like a lawn and garden item, you know, that people yeah. would use in the spring and summer. And I found it on a fluke again, because I was just scanning randomly through the store. Mm -hmm. And I realized, oh yeah, okay, this is a good product. I'll, I'll buy this and take a chance. So I did. And I sold uh, pretty well, but I really wasn't paying attention to the quantity I was selling. And so the next year I overbought, I didn't keep track oh, okay. of what I had actually sold. And so I ended up, I ate a lot of inventory that year because I didn't, I only sold 50% of what I bought. Okay. That was huge. That was, oh, uh, that was, oh, uh, that was a killer. So what do you do then? Do, <laughs> Not you, happy. do you take it back from Amazon and try to sell it on eBay or like what do you I do? I did. Yeah. For most of it, I did. I, I actually donated some of it because um, okay. it was a, it was an item that like something like a food pantry could use. Okay. So I, I donated some of it and I, and it was also an item that expired. So that was the, oh, that was the double okay. whammy. Not only did I have overstock, but I had it overstock of an item that would eventually expire. So I only had a limited time window to sell it really because who wants to buy something expired? You really right, don't, right? Right. So I did try and flip as many as I could on Amazon, from Amazon to eBay, and I did that, but I still came out with a loss. Wow. So it happens. Yes, yeah. even wah, to the wah. best. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> the the want wah horns for me. The price is definitely wrong. Horns for wow. me. <laughs> okay. And then yeah. So your other tip is your third tip is inch deep, mile wide, something like oh, that. Oh, actually, before we talk about okay. the third one, can we just sure. go back and about the numbers? Because if yes, this, yes. if I had paid attention, if I had really paid attention to the numbers on this this particular thing with my overstock inventory, I would have saved myself a huge hassle. And part of the reason I did that was that I hadn't really incorporated my 
Amazon business into my bookkeeping system. Oh. So I really wasn't checking it on a regular basis. I mean, I was checking it when I got paid, but not yeah. necessarily um, when it was coming into me. I, I didn't really, I wasn't looking at every single transaction the way I should have been. And I think that one of the best things you can do if you are, if you, especially if you want to ramp up your FBA business mm -hmm. is to really treat it like it's a real business okay. that not, not a hobby. And for me, that means setting it up as a separate business checking account and use something like QuickBooks online. I mean, I think this is good advice for anyone who's in, in business that you'd want to go ahead and, and do these things anyway, just for your financial well-being. Yeah. But you know, QuickBooks is not that expensive, and the benefit of QuickBooks is that it pulls in so many transactions automatically. Like That's it hooks awesome. up to your bank account. You can hook it up in all sorts of ways to your payment processors and all sorts of things. So, right. yeah, I would recommend doing that. And I made another really big mistake related to that when I um, didn't understand how I got paid from Amazon. So the first year. I would get a disbursement for Amazon and I thought, okay, this is my gross income for this particular product, you know, this mm -hmm. particular pay period. But it wasn't, it was actually, it, it was actually less than what I had actually made because they were taking out my sales fees and, and other fees. So what I was oh. getting was actually the net, not the gross. Okay. So I, I underreported my income that year by a third. Wow. You can imagine. It. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. It oh, it was ugly and oh embarrassing. Yeah. So I, had to, yeah. I had to amend the tax return that year and everything. So. Oh my gosh. Was, yeah. Well, yeah. Lori and I, Lori and I have had many conversations about <laughs> this financial side. So Lori, definitely, she's more of a financial planner type kind of gal. So for her to make a mistake like that means it can happen to anybody. Soul so, crushing, my friend. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Wow. Not fun. More yeah, made a financial was, mistake. Mm, what? Oh, it was a doozy. <laughs> yes, it was. No, that's good to know. And the whole QuickBooks thing. I've. It's funny because I go back and forth with that because I don't know what the online cost is. Is it a monthly in the cloud cost? So no, yes. Okay. Yeah, and it, it it tears up based on whether or not you have things like payroll or if you turn on different turn on and off different options. So you can, I mean, I think you can get it as low as $15 a month, if, okay. you know, and then you can also reduce that by just prepaying it for the year. Right. So there are different, some different ways you can do it. That, yeah. But I think overall, just for peace of mind stuff, it's, oh, it really will make yeah. you so much happier when you start looking at your, even things like starting to prepare for your taxes, you know what that's mm -hmm. like in April, oh, it's, yeah. or, you know, if you leave it till April, mm -hmm. <laughs> but if, you, if you're starting to get your stuff together a little bit earlier, you're still going through all the mess of paperwork, receipts, right. files, you know, the, it just takes forever. Right. And I love, I love QuickBooks because it really is one button. You can print out a report and you can see your profit and loss for the day, the week, the month, the year. And you can, you know, it keeps it historically too. So you can see, well, did I make money this year as an, an Amazon seller? Did I make more this year than I did last year? And you can start really kind of know, you know your numbers. You know mm -hmm. what's profitable for you and what isn't. And again, that saves you a lot of headache down the road just from a, a tax purpose. Right. But you'll be making so much better, so many more better decisions. Is that even, is that even a, a yeah. proper way to say yeah. it? Yeah, no, I know what you mean. I mean, the, uh, you're going to come back. We already You already promised me this, that you're going to come back and talk about this very thing and and uh, more information for entrepreneurs and kind of those of us who yes. may not be psyched about numbers, but, you know, psyched about earning money, <laughs> yes. but not necessarily the tracking piece of it. And, uh. you know, but I agree, like, even just when I tried to use um, QuickBooks, just, you know, as a test, as long as you're in your calendar year or whatever, and it can pull in your bank information, it is pretty amazing what can happen automatically. Oh, it's a <laughs> It's yes, automatically is key. It's yeah. such a wonderful tool. And it really is one of those things where if you if you take a little bit of time setting it up at the beginning, and there's so many, you know, the other side of this is we work in, you know, we work in the online sphere where everybody has access to a VA or knows where they can go to find that kind of talent. And there are so many people who do bookkeeping for small businesses mm -hmm. and e commerce. Uh, businesses and they know once you set it up they can go in and you give them an access and they go in and they update your books and it takes them a couple hours a month and it's something that it's a it's freedom from the stress of doing it it's freedom from something that might be a tedious task you know you, you may not want to do it yourself 
you know you may you may want to learn how to do it so you understand the the inter, you know the intricacies of it but it's something that you don't necessarily have to spend time doing yourself you can focus on your your own specialty what what you do best and mm-hmm. you can hire someone for really a reasonable amount of money to to keep it going if you don't want to to do it yourself and i think i think personally that's probably the first business um, partner I would bring on if you're doing something like this or employee even even as a freelancer to just right. pay a couple hours worth a month and have someone do it for you it's, just it's it fantastic yeah. yeah cool it's, well, that's it's great really really good advice just before anybody gets themselves because <laughs> you want to be successful but you don't want to feel like in addition to your success now you have this kind of you know, financial burden or a tax yeah. issue or whatever, like you mentioned, like just avoid it up front and stay on top of it right out of the gate. And then you, you should be okay. That's great yes. advice. Yeah. yeah. So then what was number three in your tip list? My third tip would be go an inch deep and a mile wide. And yes, I, I when I originally thought about this, I was thinking, wait, inch, inch wide, mile deep? No, no, inch <laughs> deep, mile wide. Yes, that's okay. what it was. Cool. And I think basically what I think is a really wonderful um, plus about being an Amazon FBA seller is that this gives you a chance as a business owner to explore. And it's probably the one business that you can do right off the bat where you don't have to build a website. You don't have to do an opt-in form. You don't have to create a brand. You don't have to stick to even one product line or two product lines or even do the research to figure out, does my target market even want this? Right. <laughs> do they want this kind of profit? And so that gives you a lot of flexibility. I mean, imagine you could just go into any store anytime, you take out your phone, you start scanning, yeah. and you're not you're not wedded to that, does this product fit my brand question? Mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of flexibility and freedom in that. And so one of the things I really like to suggest that people do is when they're on their shopping runs, go to an aisle where you would never even go to if you're if you're someone who loves dogs you know go to the cat aisle if you're someone who, mm. who never plays with uh you know toys you never you don't have anyone in your life that has toys or or um that kind of stuff go in that mm-hmm. aisle go into the you know the the sporting equipment aisle the and just start scanning mm. see what you find and you know conversely if you're a woman shop for a man's clothing like go just right. go through see what you find wow. and you'd be shocked at how many how many deals are right under your nose and you'll you would never know it unless you started actively scanning yeah. as my niece says i always she jokes with me she said to me once you know if i had a barcode you would scan me and i said right at you sister that's exactly <laughs> what i would do i would be scanning you up and down and, but it's true that's it's true. Funny. It's your your best tool is that smartphone and, and just going over and scanning an item. And you never know. And when you find something you think might work, you know, don't don't spend a lot of money right up front. Just buy buy a handful of the items, just okay. a few, maybe max five, you know, okay. never a case, yep. never, yep. never a hundred. And then if they do sell out and you know it's a winner, you can right. go out and source more. And right. a lot of these, especially if it's a retail store like, say, Target or Christmas Tree Shop or something like that, you know, there are tons of them in the area. You might mm-hmm. want to, you know, plan a, doing your shopping a little further away from home. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but but you know you can go out and source more if you have to and if you want to. So right. I think that'll save that'll save you that angst of, oh, I, I bought a dud and yeah. I have a hundred of them. You right. won't have to worry about that. So at what point do you, this is just making me think of like the limitations as you're getting into this and then where it, where it might go. And I know that with your personal story, you've more to share around what motivated you to kind of get into it a little bit more, but where you're at right now, how much time and what is like the budget that you give yourself to kind of monthly, I guess, collect or so I should say source the source. stuff that you're yeah. going to sell like are, do you have a budget or do you just go out and try to find things and it totally differs from one month to to the next well i think i think when i started um really when i know when i knew that i would have to ramp it up and we will yeah. Uh, I'll, yeah we'll get into that in a, in a second when i knew i was going to have to ramp it up i knew that i was going to have to spend significant time or a portion of a day or something just a set yeah. time every week in my schedule that I was going to go to a few stores and some days I would find things some days I wouldn't and I had to be okay with that but I would just set it up in my calendar and do it and that mm-hmm. actually to invest a set amount of time was really key it really helped me in um, structuring my my inventory sourcing and it also let me spread it out a little bit too because I could visit different areas knowing that 
or even the same type of stores in different areas. But I, okay. yeah. I knew that I was going to devote three hours just, you know, it's usually like three to five on okay. a specific day. That's what I usually try and do. So once a week, no more than five hours. And I try and collect everything and label and ship everything on the same day. Wow. And so it would be like a, you know, an entire Monday. That's what I'm going to do. Okay. Um, and that's, you know, I don't think everyone has to do that. And obviously it has to be something that fits into your schedule. If that doesn't work and you need to save your boxing up and sending it to Amazon for when the kids are asleep, you know, you can do it then too. Right. There's no, there's no limit to what you can do, but I think just getting in the routine of making that buying trip is really critical because, you know, if you don't have inventory in Amazon, you're not going to be able to sell anything mm -hmm. from Amazon. It's got to get into the warehouse. So okay. I think that would be my first tip in, uh, related to that. But I think in terms of financial, um, you know, a, a set amount of money, I, you know, some of my buying trips I've done as little as I, I spend $100 every time mm -hmm. or I try and spend $200 every time. I think for me, what started making my decision on what I was actually spending was how much money I really needed to pull in. And, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, when I when I first started these things, I... Uh, it was it was a hobby. Then I realized, okay, it's it's going to be more of a business. And then in 2014, my sister and I got a little bit of a, a surprise in our personal lives. Um, my dad, who was into his 80s at that point and been living alone, um, he had some significant medical issues, and there was a sudden incident, a health related incident that happened. And all of a sudden, we realized he is not going to be able to live at by himself anymore. He was he mm -hmm. had to you know, he was going to require some significant medical care. And we had to make a, a series of snap decisions, Stephanie, that were just, uh, it was, it was, time was of the essence, and we didn't quite know what we were dealing with. And in terms of how um, significant the medical piece of it was. So we had to make all these decisions really, really quickly. Mm -hmm. And they were expensive ones. And he didn't have, um, unfortunately, his financial situation was not great. He had some assets and he had some money saved, but not a lot. Mm -hmm. And so for us, we were just thrown into a, a little bit of a tail spin and we didn't mm -hmm. know what we were going to do. But we did know we had two things going for us at the beginning. We did know that we had found a place, an assisted living facility that was a great fit for what he needed. So we knew that was the right place and that, that made us feel a little bit better. But we also knew we had limited time because it was an expensive place. By our standards, and I think by most people's standards, it was a very pricey uh, endeavor to, mm -hmm. to get him in there and to have him be able to stay there. And we knew we only had a limited amount of assets that would cover a specific period of time. And we figured when we were first starting, it was going to be a year and a half. That's what we thought we had covered in the bank that we could do. And then there turned out to be issues with accessing some of the assets oh, and it wow. just, it was a headache. Thanks. But, but the other great thing about it that turned out to be a great thing was that we knew he was eligible for a position on the low income spot that the assisted living facility had. So we knew if we got him on that list, it was just a waiting game. We had mm -hmm. to figure out where he was on the list, but eventually he would qualify for one of those spots. And that would have, you know, that would mean a huge, it was almost, I think, God, it was two thirds of what the actual cost yeah. was. So that was huge. But in the meantime, uh, my sister and I are thinking, how how are we gonna how are we gonna come up with any money if he doesn't? I mean, how are we gonna do this if he doesn't get on the list? We had no idea what was gonna happen. None. And Lori, do you mind saying the exact numbers just so people know what yeah. the possibilities yeah. are here? I know it's really private sensitive yes. stuff, but if yep. you're cool I know, with it. Well, no, I am. And I think um, I think it's eye opening for a lot of people to hear mm -hmm. it out loud, too, because mm -hmm. we get into these situations where we think, oh, it's covered by this. It's covered by that. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it wasn't. It was not. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we were we had the, the cost of his care was six thousand dollars a month. Wow. And yeah, it was it was crazy That's expensive. Amazing. You know, yeah. how many mortgage payments is that? You, exactly. you know, these the, the magnitude of that number for most people. It's insane. Right. So, but, you know, we knew at the time that we were holding out, okay, if he gets on the list, that's $2,000 a month. So that's mm -hmm. much better than 6,000. We can handle that, but still we're going right. to run out of money right. <laughs> really fast <laughs> and right. we have to figure out, and it's not our money, you know, and at this point we knew, you know, this was, this was everything that he had, everything that he had saved and yeah. we had to make it go as far as we could. So we did. And, and then it hit me, wait a minute can I turn on the Amazon spigot here? Can I ramp this up? I mean, how much more would I have mm -hmm. to put into it to do it? It's 
I'm, I'm devoting the same amount of time. Can I, can I get more product? Can I be more um, savvy in what I'm buying? Can I, can I get these, this up to a point? So I made mm-hmm. it a goal. I thought, all right, let's see if I can get to $6,000 a month. And I didn't get to 6,000. I will say I keep trying every, every, every month yeah. I keep trying, but I came close. I came really close. A lot of the time I came, um, I got it as high as $4,200 a month wow. where I was pulling in for some of the seasonal items that That's I sell, amazing. which was great. I was really happy about that. And that made a, a huge, that was a nice comfort for me because it could go into savings and it could go, you know, it, the, the, the net of it could go into savings. And I knew that we had that money available should we need it. So that's what we did. And then a couple of months ago, six months ago now, he ended up being qualified for that list, for that spot on that low income list. So we had spent all the money. It got down (laughs) to a few very hairy months. Yes. (laughs) That we were, we were funding it. And then he got on the list and ah, a lot less money. And so now the, now what I am bringing in on Amazon is extra and can go to a savings account for him. I can use it for other things, use it for more inventory, but I know I, I look back at that and I think, wow, that was that was a tremendous ability. I didn't have to go out and spend another 40 hours on an, another job. I had the right. ability to do it in a more passive way and it worked. That's so, just so amazing too. I mean, there's just so many people in that situation, whether it's they have too many kids, they can't go to work and, you know, paying for help for your kids so you can mm-hmm. work, you know, like that whole catch 22 and then an aging parent or somebody's disabled or out of work spouse, whatever. That's awesome. I mean, that yeah, is was, significant money. I mean, we are in the periphery of the country. So yeah, things are more absolutely. expensive here, but that money would go very far in other parts of the States, right? Like, yes, definitely. I mean, you could see, yeah, we are, we live in one of the most expensive areas of, of the country. And so, yeah. yeah, I can imagine that kind of care if we'd been living in another place probably would have been a lot less, but yeah. you know, I'm not sure by much. And Right. This, this is the striking point of it, too, not to go too far off topic, but, you know, nursing home care, it, like full nursing home care stuff is twice that at, at the yeah. very minimum. So that's right. $12,000 a month. I mean, uh, think of that. Yeah, I know. It's uh, one of my clients does in-home care for for, you know, for anybody recovering from surgery or elderly, whatever, disabled. And, um, you know, so I've run the numbers for her just running, you know, creating her her campaigns and ad that kind of thing so the cost comparison i mean if you can keep (laughs) if you can keep somebody out of one of those facilities you're saving a lot of money for sure oh yeah yeah absolutely yeah yeah it's crazy what they can charge oh my not that (sighs) they i'm sure that they deserve it on some level but (laughs) well i will say i do think the quality of care he gets now is spectacular and i'm really it was the right place and you know what if the other thing was that we were wrestling with what if we had to move him Oh, can you imagine? I, I mean, wow. you, we committed all of our resources to getting him in the right spot just to begin with, and then to have to upend it and move him. Right. We were, we were dreading that, and it turned out we didn't have to. So Thank that goodness. was that Yay. was good. Yeah. yeah. Thank good. you. Thank you, Amazon. I know. Well, that's the thing. It's like you need to send a little letter to Amazon. Dear Amazon. Dear Amazon. Thank you for helping my, name is my Lori. dad. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. We should share this and we'll tag, we'll tag them in the post. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That's so funny. Yeah. Wow. So we made it through three. What's the last one, Lori? Oh, my gosh. Well, the last one... Boy, this, uh, oh no, we audacious. didn't. We no. didn't. Do did we do? Oh, we, we didn't did do. We didn't do. Uh, that's right. We did number three, but we didn't do four. Even though yeah, you and okay. I have talked about this yes. endlessly, yes. endlessly, because this applies to any any audacious mama who's been in business, wants to be in business, is exploring the online selling space. My biggest tip here would be spend money on inventory. Don't spend it on training. Right. And, and that doesn't hold true the whole way through the process, but at least at first, you know, I would ask anyone who's trying to do this and, and make a significant amount of money um, or, and, or, or, and, or just prove it to themselves that it can be done. Put that money into getting product to Amazon mm-hmm. and down the road, you can get every course you could ever want on Amazon FBA. And believe me, there are some winners out there and then there are some duds and there mm-hmm. are some really expensive ones. And there are ones that are worth the money because they're updated all the time. And, you know, if anyone ever wants recommendations on that, they can get in touch with me and I'd be happy to go through a list of, you know, things that I've, I've used myself, but there are a few proven ones, but right now you don't need all the bells and whistles. You just need to know 
how to how to do the process, how to do the sourcing, and how to get the product to Amazon, and then figure out, okay, am I making good decisions? Are these products that I've sourced making me money? And you won't know that if you don't spend any money and get the stuff to Amazon. So right. I'd say take advantage of any free resources you can. Podcasts, podcasts mm. are golden. I mean, you you know you have them. Yeah, <laughs> we, we you and I are both avid podcast listeners. We love them. Right. But I I can't think of a better tool to kind of propel you forward because it's free. You can listen while you're sourcing. You can listen in the car. You can mm-hmm. listen anytime you want, and it will give you so much more for you know not a lot of cash outlaid than you could ever get from mm-hmm. a course when you're starting. So oh, I would say smart. you know spend it on sourcing. Cool. I love that. This has been so helpful, Lori. So I'm just imagining the people and I still have more questions for you. But I know we want to cap this a little bit timing wise. But so if someone's listening to this, they're like, oh, this would really help with my situation. I want to know more. But this, some of this maybe sounds daunting to them. What's the next best thing they can do? They can get this tip sheet. We'll figure out how to get that to them. Yeah, But will. if they wanted to contact you as a consultant or check in with you somehow, ask you questions, what's the best well, way to reach out to you? I pretty much live on Twitter. <laughs> I love okay. Twitter so much. <laughs> so, okay. so much. Awesome. And I think that would probably, yeah, so, so much. And I think that that would be a great place people connect and we can we can hook up that way. That would be great. And my Twitter handle uh, is whirlygirllori. Okay. And it's W H I R L Y girl G I R L Lori L O R I. Okay. And yeah, line. I would love. I yeah, I really hope. I really hope that I can connect with some of your audience because I think this would be a great. Uh, it is. I know it is from personal experience. I love it, and I'm really glad I've been able to do it uh, more passively than my other two businesses. And I think a lot of audacious mamas would be interested in adding that to their repertoire as well. Totally. And yeah. I, it, I mean. This is this sounds perfect. And this is the other thing I thought of is that, you know, as a single mom, you do often get gaps of time where you're not with your kids. And sometimes you're in recovery mode. Mm -hmm. (laughs) But you do have to shop. So this is a great thing for single moms, too. Because if you have a weekend with kids, without kids, whatever, this would be you have those chunks of time that you might not otherwise have to go and maybe do the stuff that the kids might not be interested in, like the the makeup aisle and the whatever, oh, yeah. you know, so this could be a really beneficial thing. And I actually have another person who I'm going to be bringing on who's she's done, I think, more with eBay, but she is a single mom with two kids. And she's making a phenomenal amount of money um, doing this. And she also does flea markets and things like that. And she's done some Amazon as well. But um, yeah, so you guys have really opened my eyes to the possibilities with this truly, I think you can call it more passive. Obviously, there's activity, sourcing and getting it there. But then you do have that ability to kind of sit back, watch the numbers, analyze what's selling, what's not selling, and then make that decision to find something similar, get the same thing, whatever, shift gears, go experiment again. But um, it's kind of making more of a game of it, which it makes it that's fun. That's the per- perfect way to describe it. I think a lot of it is a game stuff. Yeah. I, I mean, for me, especially as someone who doesn't like to be in a shopping mall or anything like that, I, I do make it a game for myself. And to for know sure. that, okay, if I can come out with X amount of product for X amount of dollars, yay, I win. This is good. I yeah. like this. And yeah. it is fun. And I, I think that's a good way to approach it. And also, I'm sure that your friend who sells on eBay will probably let you know this too. But there is so such a significant amount of money being spent on e-commerce, on eBay, on Amazon. I heard a stat yesterday or sometime this week that three out of 10 sales online were on the Amazon platform. Three wow. out of 10. Wow. That's I mean, amazing. imagine that. Imagine the possibilities. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of opportunity there. And we didn't talk about it, but you did mention the whole private product too. So for people who already make their own stuff on Etsy or oh whatever. Oh my gosh. I can't, I can't believe we forgot to discuss that. Yeah, let's that touch because, on that real briefly oh, here. You know what? That is actually, there are, I mean, just imagine all the people you know in your circle that are, are crafters or they make a product, they have an item that they, they've they already sold either through their own website, mm-hmm. on Etsy, you know, the two, just for those, just those two examples to start. But you can actually put your private, your private product, your private label product on Amazon. I mean, you have to do it. It's a little, a little bit more complicated in setting it up. It's not as easy as, you know, sourcing inventory and sending it in that Amazon already sells through their catalog. But once you make that product listing, you can keep listing on it. You can create new ones. 
-hmm. And you can have brand exclusivity if you if you're the manufacturer of the property, the the uh, product rather, you can set it up so that you are the only seller that is allowed to sell it on Amazon. Wow. So think of the possibilities. You could have a whole product line that's specific for Amazon that you create only for Amazon, mm -hmm. or you could just use it as another channel. You right. could, you could, you know, so I sell on my website, I sell on Etsy, I sell on that's Amazon. So cool. And wow. it, it's, and you don't have to fulfill the customer service end of it as well. So right. that's, an, you know, again, you just send it in and let Amazon take care of the rest. That's huge. And the only other question that keeps popping back in my head, I keep forgetting to ask you is, so I've, you know, I'm um, an associate or whatever, an Amazon associate. And that process took a little bit of time. It was a little not, not so straightforward, but <laughs> I still haven't worked mine out. Okay, <laughs> so that's encouraging. <laughs> because so so the FBA process is pretty straightforward or, or it's, no, it's a lot better, a lot better than okay. the Amazon Associates. I will say that. Yeah. yeah. And when I first started, it was uh, it was a little complicated because I think when I first listed, I had already been on the platform as a seller, but I was merchant fulfilled, meaning okay. I did. It was the same process as eBay. I had the product and then I mailed it out to the customer directly. So I was already in the system and they basically flipped a switch and moved me over. So I had a little bit of a more streamlined process because all my information was already in there, essentially. Mm -hmm. I think I just had to ask, add my checking account, and that was it at that point, oh, and wow. verify a few things. Mm -hmm. But the, the setup is pretty easy. Once you know you fill out the basic information, they want a checking account, um, you know, they want to make sure that you're actually selling legitimately, and then you, you take it from there. They, it's, it's pretty straightforward. And if you, mm -hmm. if you do do any of the apps, the like ScanPower, um, Amazon Seller Central app, that app we talked about to scan, that's already built into the Amazon platform, so you don't have to do anything extra with that. But if you get an, uh, an app like ScanPower, they'll hook it in through their API. They do all their stuff on the back end that hooks you in and hooks up to your account. So that can add another layer of complexity, but you don't have to do that. You can just okay. stick with the free app and right. stay with Amazon Seller Central. So it, it's much more straightforward. I, I Yeah, if you get the Amazon Associates thing figured out, please, can you do mine? Because it's not, <laughs> it's not working for me. I no, can't get it to work, right? Yeah, no, I know. I know. <laughs> I've seen, I've, I actually did take a little mini course on it and it was okay. But yeah, I ran into way more problems than the course mentioned. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> interesting. Well, that's, re that's relief though, because that is a pretty, like there are lots of people who are bloggers or whatever, who have their, you know, their Amazon associate links just to get a little bit here, a little bit yeah. there. And so that's supposed to be a pretty simple process, but it sounds like this is more streamlined and, and even easier than that. So if somebody's tried to do something like that with Amazon and they were, you know, kind of not happy about it or ran into a tangle, that's good to know that this is easier. I think it sounds, could be yeah. a, an easier opportunity. And I think they'd stand a little bit uh, a stand, they'd stand a chance of making a lot more money. A lot more money. <laughs> I Sounds think, like a yeah, lot more money. Yeah. Yeah. Your percentage wise that, you know, on a product you source, it's always going to be better than just a small percentage sure. of what Amazon's selling it for. Oh, yeah. So I'd say, yeah, if you had to pick one or the other and you can, you can, you know, get into quick learning mode and it's really not that difficult. I'd say go, go the FBA seller route, cool. get on there. Do I'm going to try it. That sounds yeah. awesome. I think, I, yeah, I know you'd be great at it. Thanks. I'm gonna <laughs> maybe, try you'll anyway. find that, maybe you'll find that makeup that we were talking about the other day. Maybe <laughs> you'll find it before I do. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Those are the things we get addicted to, right? Mm -hmm. So that's a good way to do it. Awesome. Well, this has been phenomenal, Lori. And so you're you're on Twitter. You're Whirly Girl Lori, and it's yep. Lori L O R I Whirly Girl yes. Lori. And what else? This tip and sheet. We'll do that. Give it to yeah, me. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that tip sheet. We'll do. Okay. I'll do. A, well, I gave you the four good ones that I thought would be most helpful at this point. But you know, okay. I have another handful or two that I can add on, and okay. we'll do a little a more comprehensive one, maybe ten tips, and then you know. Okay. We can go from there. I think that would, you know, it's really not that much. You don't need much more than that. That's for sure. Yeah, it's, it is a short learning curve overall. So I think 10 tips tops, you'll be out there making money. No time flat. Awesome. Thanks so much, Lori. I'm looking forward to doing more of this with you. Thank Enjoyed you, it. Steph. I hope we can soon. Okay. Take care. Bye. Bye. Like what you heard? Well, we're just getting started. Subscribe to the podcast, then rate, review and share, share, share. Steph will read reviews on the podcast and she'll choose a lucky winner each month. The prize? An Amazon gift card to say thanks for listening and sharing. 
So head to iTunes to leave a review before you forget. Need some help with social strategy or video marketing? Reach out to Steph at stephanieroberts.com. That's Stephanie with an I, no E. Or call 617-657-4441. Join Steph on Twitter at Steph Gets Social. Oh, 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 oh,